of our attendees who are joining us either through our Zoom link or on YouTube Live um, this afternoon, this evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, my name's Paul Bright. I'm the Technical Director for the Coaching Manual, and we're really pleased to be able to bring you another fantastic webinar uh, through the Coaching Manual. And again, we will be taking uh, questions through the Zoom webinar chat, and we will also ensure that this recording is put onto the coachingmanual.com. So we have a great webinar lined up today around player and team engagement, and it's very, very relevant um, considering um, the current issues and, and current uh, climate that we have to deal with in terms of training our players and, and restrictions on that. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our two panellists for today's webinar. So first off, we have Ian McClurg. Ian is originally from Northern Ireland um, and now resides in Lancaster, Ontario, just outside of Toronto in Canada. Uh, Ian's a US, uh, UEFA A license and USSF B license coach and also holds a master's in performance coaching at the University of Stirling. Um, having completed his FA Level 1 talent identification course, and Ian founded and established 1v1 Soccer as one of Canada's leading private soccer academies. Um, and he's also, also the author of Play the 1v1 Way. Um, Ian is a former North American talent ID scout and coach for Wolverhampton Wanderers in the Premier League. And he's also a former Toronto FC Academy coach and is now um, obviously founder and head of the Ian McClurg Learn to Form coaching website and programme. So thank you so much, Ian, for joining us today. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, long, long uh, bio there, so looking forward <laughs> to getting, getting some of the insights. Because I'm, I'm very old, that's why. <laughs> no, we never said that. Never said that. Um, fantastic. So... Uh, moving on, uh, our second panellist is Matt Morley. Matt is currently Sheffield United Football Club's uh, lead foundation phase coach within the academy. Uh, Matt is obviously a UEFA coach and graduated in 2019 from the ECAS programme. Uh, the ECAS programme is a, is a two-year programme run by the Premier League called the Elite Coach Apprenticeship Scheme. It's a real high-level uh, coaching programme. And Matt has been with Sheffield United Football Club within the academy for 17 seasons. Now it's a Category 1 academy uh, in England and has a fantastic track record of producing professional players as well. Um, and Matt's role within the academy is to coordinate, plan, coach, lead and oversee everything from the pre-academy and the foundation phase programming. So that's U7 to U12s within Sheffield United's academy. So... Thank you so much, Matt, for joining us uh, again today. Thank you, and uh, thanks for having me again. Brilliant. And, and again, uh, someone with some fantastic experiences, you know, a wealth of knowledge and seeing players progress into, into the professional game, or just be a success as, as young men as well. So we'll tap into some of that. So um, we'll, we'll make a start, guys. And obviously, the... the the theme of player and team engagement right now is really, really relevant considering the current climate. So I've got a few few questions that we've obviously posed and, and Ian and, and Matt have both kindly sent through some presentations that I will uh, display throughout. Um, but first off, Ian, I, I want to ask you, you know, with, with your organisation and with you training both individual players and teams, what methods do you use, not not just during this, you know, this this period of time, but even even before that? What methods do you use to engage with players, parents, and teams? Yeah, a couple of methods. Obviously, um, obviously, you've got to communicate the daily stuff, which are obviously training schedules and email correspondence back and forth with parents and players, just keeping everyone in the loop, basically. And second of all, we had a home uh, training program I kind of developed myself about five years ago. So I developed a series of YouTube videos and just keep the players engaged away from our training center. Um, my model's a bit different than Matt's, obviously, because I'm training individual players. Uh, our players play elsewhere, so they're coming to us basically about 10 hours a month for additional training. So uh, a little bit complicated in terms of obviously their schedules because our players are busy with their teams. So we have to be very flexible regarding our, our training schedule and make sure we're we're staying in contact uh, constantly with our, our player, player families. I would say, um, and to see later on, our, our models changed a lot regarding engagement the last two, two and a half months, I think for the better. 
I think one lesson I've learned out of this is, is that we had some opportunities that we weren't taking advantage of in terms of um, uh, maybe helping a players in more regard and support at home versus obviously our, our training at, at the center. Thank you for that, Ian. I, I did show show your slide there, but your comment around, you know, I think it's been a massive learning curve for everybody involved in the game over the last two and a half months, and and we will get into that. So it really has been, yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, and and Matt, obviously, you're working with the youngest age groups within a professional academy setting, and and you know, I've worked at that at the foundation phase myself in in a professional club, and. You know, new parents to the game, high expectations. Uh, little Johnny's going to be the next Premier League star. So it's important that that uh, clubs and coaches uh, stay engaged, not just with players, but with with parents as well. So what are some of the methods that, that you utilise at Sheffield United uh, to stay engaged with, with those families? I think if you just uh, you just alluded to, I think the engagement, you know, the relationship with the parents is key. I think you know when the boys come in at pre academy, you know whether it's a, a six or seven, uh, hopefully they're going to stay in the building for you know the twenty four months before they sign it on the nines. Um, I think Sheffield United have been quite successful uh, regards that because I would say between sixty five and seventy five percent of the players that come in pre academy they go on to sign it on the nines. So I think then relationships are, um, they're already cemented, uh, but then it's kind of like taking them to the next level in terms of kind of like what the expectations are, what the club expectations are, what their program's yeah. going to look like. Um, again, you'll still get uh, people who, you know, see little Johnny and they put him on a pedestal. And I think it's just kind of, like, it's them conversations about, you know, it's about the, that foundation, the first steps on the ladder you know, about where a six and seven year old is and what, what they should be doing, whether it's, you know, play, you know, loads of technical work. But, uh, but for me, it's the key is relationships. And I think that, you know, in teens, um, I've, let, I've met a lot of people. Uh, and again, I think it comes down to the honesty and that respect. And I think, again, you know, you keep always keeping your integrity in place, but it's about, you know, we're a support network. So when you look at the player, the support network of the coach, the club, uh, and you know the parents, you know for me we've got to work together if it's going to benefit the player long term. Absolutely, and obviously working working with the the youngest age groups within the academy, how much contact time typically do you get with them both in the pre academy then if, if they're fortunate enough to sign uh, academy forms. So with the pre-academy boys, they're in uh, four hours, four hours a week, and then the game program, um, and then when they step up to the under nines to twelves, it's five and a half hours, including a games program. Um, so you know the contact time is it, it's there for us, you know, to get to know the boys, but also on the downtime, you know, to get to know the parents, get to know the schools, especially when they go to under nines. Because their education is, you know, it is paramount. And I think getting to know how little Johnny is at home and what his characteristics are, what his personality is, what he's like at school. So maybe even going into school, you know, our education officer, but I've been into a number of schools. Uh, because I think that the more we know about that boy and the more we know about him within our environment, you know, it's going to help him. And, and again, for me, it's not about the, the 12 months or the 10 months that they play. You know, we're looking at, our job or my job, can we get them boys to under 12s, to you know, that under 13 C and YDP? So you're probably looking at three or four years. So again, you know, what's the conversations? Who are we talking to? Um, so it is a joined up thinking method. Brilliant. Um, and, and touching on that, that contact time, Ian, I'm going to ask you a question here and, and we'll, we'll flip it back to Matt as well. Do you, do you think, obviously there's, there's been a huge change in generations and you know, formal practice and formal training seems to have overtaken the the street football mentality of previous generations. And, you know, the generation I come through, we, we did more street football and playing out on the streets and the parks than, than we did formal training. Uh, so, Ian, how, how, how do you ad address that in terms of what what your training principles are? Are you trying to replicate some of that? you know, imagination and innovation in, in your play 1v1. Yeah, it's actually quite a culture shock for me to come from uh, back home to North America because back home I started playing um, maybe formalized football at probably nine, ten years of age. 
over yep. here we have U3 programs in North America. So the kids kind of almost are born, obviously, again, trying a soccer shirt on them. So I came a different environment and I had a little bit uh, tough time adapting that initially. Um, I, I'm a big believer in in uh, the players trying things, making lots of mistakes, uh, and kind of working through problems and to find solutions. That's why I learned myself uh, as, as a player. So I had kind of a, a layered approach to things in terms of just basic uh, ball mastery skills and building from there. Uh, we have a little different season over here because of the weather. So we're six months indoors. I'm a big advocate of futsal. So we play a lot of futsal um, during wintertime, especially when gyms for six months started our 12 month program. Um, okay. So definitely from my, my point of view, I think uh, if you want to develop creative players, um, you've got to give them lots of opportunities to try things in one-to-one -one situations. That means small sided games. That means futsal, I think is brilliant for that uh, in terms of also teaching attacking and defending principles and that transition game as well. So uh, I'm very much an advocate of, of trying to make it less structured versus more structured. It's very structured North America. I think it's a, to, to its detriment, to be honest. Yeah, and, and you know, I'm, I'm sharing the slide that you sent through here on, on your training principles. And one, one of the things, well, there's a couple of, of lines of no, I think love, love of the game um, and, and that desire to learn are probably two what jumped out to me because, you know, without that love of the game, that, that love of the game was developed by players in previous generations just going out and playing, right? Just playing with your friends, challenging each other. It wasn't a development of a love of the game because I go to this training program two, three, four, five times a week. It was that inherent everything what your team what, what your friends did on, on the local estate. So how how do you go about ensuring that love of the game, Ian? And then I'll ask um, I'll ask you Matt the same question. Yeah, it's probably more responsibility over here in North America because it's not seen as a, the major sport. Obviously, we've got ice hockey in Canada as, as the major sport. So a lot of the parents um, we work with, they haven't played the game before. I mean, I have as, as much knowledge as the, obviously the parents back in the UK and so forth. So a big part of our job is, is sort of education around the game and fostering that love of the game. Uh, and thankfully, in today's age, the kids can watch lots of European football right now regarding um, obviously YouTube and also live games as well. So it's helped a little bit uh, the last um, couple of years. When I first came here in 81, I was hard pressed to find football on television. I was brought up in a culture <laughs> of going there, they, you know, obviously every week with my grandfather, my uncle and watching the game. And my kids were Linfield back in Belfast. And that kind of fostered my love of the game. So I try to find ways over here to, to kind of um, replicate that, if you will, uh, as best we can. But it's, it's so important because I think that um, – uh, I, was actually, I was on a webinar a few weeks ago where Bert, Bernie had talked about the first thing is love of the, game, love of the ball, for example. I think that's a very important concept. We lose, lose track off, um, get to know the ball, get to love the ball. Um, that's how I grew up. And that's, a, that's my love of the game came from that, uh, my love of touching the football. And uh, my family always tell me that there's no family photographs of me growing up without a football man <laughs> regarding the photographs and the videos. And I think that part, um, North America is missing out a little bit on. So we try to foster that. Um, Obviously, uh, I do a number of ways just, just through our sessions, make them fun, enjoyable, uh, have the kids, um, like I say, play on structured football as much as possible and try to obviously have that concept of going home and working your game at home. That's how I learned myself, hour in, hour out, as you guys did against a brick wall many, many times, repetition. And I think it's something that's missing over here and I think it's, it's a very important aspect uh, of the game. Brilliant. I've actually been to Windsor Park as well yeah. in, uh, to see a game, believe it or <laughs> good not. Stuff, um, good I've, stuff. Sometimes I've seen Linfield. Um, Matt, sa same for you as well. You know, the, the pressures, and I know there's been research recently about, you know, the statistics 0.012% of young people who enter a professional academy are going to make it to the Premier League. Obviously, club by club, it differs. But we're talking about four hours a week and then on to five hours a week for young players who, who effectively still babies really how does Sheffield United and your staff go about and, and yourself go about ensuring that they still develop that inherent love for the game as well and is there opportunities for less organized sessions and, and just go out and play and be imaginative yeah I think that uh, you know it all comes back down to your environment and your culture um, again I've been there for a long long time and you know, I've seen six academy managers um, and, you know, they all got uh, different strengths. Uh, and I think when you look at um, the foundation phase or pre-academy, you know, for me, it's about, you know, Ian's just alluded to it, about play and that love of the game, about the contacts, about that expression, about being an individual, you know, that, that creativity. But all that in mind, how do you create that? 
you know, what type of games is it? Is it deliberate play? You know, is it play itself? Is it individual? Is it team? You know, what type of games are you playing in there? Whether it's racket sport, you know, the ball games, basketball, um, athletics, you know, all them types of games, exotic games to support with the, um, you know, the physical literacy. Um, and again, you know, when you're talking about ownership, I think that, um, you know, Nick Cox, who's the academy manager at uh, Man United now, yeah. um, he was massive into uh, street football. And we used to do street football games. Um, he even had us down at Bramall Lane uh, during, the, uh, during the meetings when he was speaking with the parents. We were on the car park playing. And again, it was kind of like you jump as a goalpost. So it was actually winding back the years about what we did as kids. So I think yeah. it's replicating what they do at school because I don't see um, an academy being any different to school where it's a, it's a learning environment. You know, it's a, it's a learning classroom. But I think it's the variety and opportunities that we expose the boys to that, you know, again, the success in your program will be from, do your boys come every week? Do they return? And I think if they're enjoying it, they're walking in with a smile on the face, they're walking back with, uh, with a smile on the face and they return the next session, then you're doing something right. But I don't think you can stand still. And I think you've got to keep, you know, you've got to keep evolving all the time. And, you know, Ian mentioned futsal. Um, we've got a futsal program, you know, they do it every Friday, uh, mixed age groups. And it's fantastic because, again, them constraints of playing a different game, they don't get the understanding behind why they're playing it, which is kind of like that camouflage coaching or camouflage in the game. But they enjoy it and they love it. But then you're yeah. linking it into your individual, you know, the ones or your 3v2s, you know, our balance. So, I think, again, there's a lot of football clubs out there, you know, like Sheffield United, like Ian, like a lot of coaches, you know, they are being um, creative, they are inventing new ways because we've got to coach for the children. And they are children, they're young children. So we've got to give them. And, and Pete Sturgis talked about, you know, if you've got a, a happy player, you've got a good player. I love that. Brilliant insight and, and obviously some fantastic work that, that you've done at Sheffield United over the years because the proof's in the pudding, players who are coming through and, and staying with the programme and graduating as professionals. Um, over the last few months, you know, we kicked off with, in the last two and a half months, three months, not just grassroots coaches, not just coaches in competitive clubs globally, but even the professional programmes, everybody's had to adapt. Um, and Matt, I'm going to... I'm going to show, obviously, the home programme. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. The home programme that, that Sheffield United um, developed. And, and we're just going to get into this. So, obviously, COVID comes out of the blue. Can't meet all player. That, that team training is gone straight away. So, um, obviously, you, you've set this home programme with your staff for the foundation phase um, quickly. So, couple of things that, that I wanted to ask you on this in terms of obviously setting a development plan, but the individual plan and the use of, of technology. Did, did your players have individual plans to begin with in terms of setting, setting things that you'd like them to work on um, away from practice the, anyway? The, sorry, they, they've had a homework programme and they've also had a yep. physical programme. So um, the sports science have always sent kind of like the six o'clock stretch. Um, so while moms and dads are having the tea, they can have a six o'clock stretch. Um, so basically, you know, just I think I need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, st I'm still recovering. <laughs> yeah. uh, but so, no, you know, kind of like the six o'clock stretch of kind of like that uh, flexibility and, you know, and supporting them. And I think that it's not exposing them to anything that they won't do at the academy. Um, so linking into this. Uh, it was more about, you know, the staff got together, the academy manager, all the phase leads, and we talked about what we were going to do, you know, phase specific. You know, we've gone from five and a half hours uh, to zero. Um, and I think it was kind of, you know, we get around the table, we talk. So myself and my colleague who works in pre-academy, my other colleague who works in foundation phase, we just came up with an idea, but we didn't want it to be um, a dictation of kind of the coaches we wanted to put some elements onto the players. So the players itself, and when you go through the, the program, a lot of it was about them inventing. So we asked them to put a plan together because a lot of the, the children were still at school. Now, quite a few, including my daughter, who's 10 year old, thought, oh yeah, we're on holiday now. We could have six, eight weeks off. And it's like, no, 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 no. You've still got to do your education. So we asked them to put a, a, a plan together per week. 
uh, which kind of their education in the morning, uh, which went from morning to afternoon, you know, depending on what their subject was. And then after that, we asked them to kind of like, we sent them some stuff through Top Techers, which is part of the coaching manual. Um, I have to say it was one of the, the best investments um, that the, the club have made. Um, I've spoke to a couple of guys, you know, who also run Top Techers about how they use that. Sam Keats at Burnley recently. Uh, but we, you know, we moved it on to then individual programmes. So the individual programmes about what they were doing in the week, whether it was football, uh, whether it was social. Um, but we asked them to kind of like run it on the guidelines of Monday, Wednesday, Friday, which their training, their training days would be. So yeah. education in the morning. And then after that, I want to do some training, whether it's physical, you know, uh, a bit of agility work, coordination work, a bit of ball mastery, you know, the sessions that we actually catered, the top techers that were in there. But keep the weekends free because social time, downtime is massive. Go for a ride with your bike, go with your family, go for walks, you know, go for picnics, you know, go and sit in the garden. So I think there was a lot of stuff in the, uh, the programs that the boys uh, were very, very capable of creating. You know, things they did was create a session, a family session. But every session that they did, they had to film and they had to send it through to me on WhatsApp. So my WhatsApp group is just completely, my phone's blown up twice because of all the pictures. But you've had people uh, cooking dinner. You've had people cooking meals. You've had breakfast. You've had people washing cars. You've had emptying tumble dryers. So all the other bits. But the one that really impressed me was the kind of like the session that they did for the family. So, you know, they come to the academy. They do a warm-up. They do a technical. They do a small-sided game. We actually challenged them to come up with a 10-minute session to use their family. Use the cat and dog. Use the goldfish. I don't care. <laughs> as long as it was involved. And what they had to do, they had to plan it and write it down. And then they had to deliver it and film it. And some of the videos were absolutely fantastic. And I think credit to the boys, really, really credit to the boys and credit to the families, you know, for that support within this period. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a few, there's a few items you've touched on that, that I'd like to ask you as well now, Matt. Is, and, and, and I read through the presentation that you sent me and I love some of the, the key points. The, the social time I'm going to come to shortly uh, because I've got that as a separate question because I think we can't lose sight on that. So I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to just pass that by. But there's a couple of things that I really liked. Um, the first one that I wanted to pull up and get your insight on was this coffee <laughs> chat. I thought it was a brilliant idea. You know, we talk, we've just been talking myself, you and Ian, about developing that love for the game and love for the ball. And Sheffield United have come up with this coffee cat idea of recreating you know, classic, well, the classic for the young players, aren't the classic goals. Um, can can you recreate these goals? Search on YouTube. Um, and I love that. Um, and we'll get on to the skill skills. So th were the players sending you videos on, on these classic goals as well? Yeah, and they were putting different shirts on as well. If they actually had the shirts <laughs> on, so you had your, your Brazil and your Portuguese shirts on. But, you know, I think it's uh, a lot. I think when they went into lockdown, um, there was a lot of interaction on, you know, on Twitter, social media, you know, the toilet roll challenge, you know, the bins, the top techers, you know, top bins, you know, putting the crossbar and so on. And again, I believe that every boy now has access to social media, uh, especially YouTube. And you can see that in how that transfers into training. So if they love the Messi's or the Ronaldo's and somebody was talking to me the other day about Iniesta, and he's going, oh, you know, I love how he NS the plays in the tight and he gets on the ball and his distribution, you know, how he's scanning and so on. And I'm thinking, wow, you're 10 year old, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, so I think it linked into, into that really about, you know, we got together as a group of staff and we wanted to come up with kind of like, uh, you know, areas they could practice, whether it was a dribble, whether it was a shot. And then we just researched it and put it together. And I have to say, again, you know, the returns have been fantastic, you know, from what the kids have been sending. And we just called it copycat. You know, it was a simple term. You know, can you right. copy, you know, your best mate? Or can you copy, you know, uh, Burkamp's turn or, you know, his flick over the head and scoring against Leicester? Whatever it was going to be. But you know, it was just an opportunity for them to visualise it and then go and practice it and deliver it. So it's been great. Brilliant. And then... 
the, the second thing I noticed, obviously, it tied in closer with the top techers that, that you've been using as well, was, was your skills school and your skills tasks and the setting of, of challenges for your young players. I'm showing the table there with, with some of the, the key components and skills and, and, and scores. And then the individual development plans, really, of obviously working on top techers challenge app, you know, your technical weekly plan looking on your strengths because I think we forget that as coaches as well sometimes you know we've all been guilty of it I definitely have in terms of we're always trying to fix things but if you're you're creating young professionals hopefully then it's so important that they're working on the strengths as well and, and turning turning that strength into a nine or a ten out of ten because ultimately that's what's going to get you the pro contract what are you a nine or ten out of ten in what are you bringing to the table so how how did you know the, the technical training and and and, and the use of this technical week of fun and the top techers, how how was it perceived by the players and what was the feedback? Oh, fantastic. Yeah, uh, really, really good. Um, the, the comments, and I think that, you know, what's nice is that the academy manager, um, he's, you know, we've been making, uh, and we'll go into it later with the Zoom calls, but, you know, we've been uh, speaking to the parents every other week, so every two weeks, and it was basically in base just to say, hello, how are you? How's the family? That was it. And, you know, the first thing that uh, they'd say on the phone is, oh, they're doing the top techers and they're doing the homework. And I'm like, no, don't worry about that. I'm not worried about that. I'm just asking if you're okay. Um, but the kids have loved it. Um, there, there has been some negatives as well uh, because, you know, the, the sports scientists, we were working together as an MDT and the sports scientists were giving me certain things. Um, and we were putting them out there related to the age groups. Um, but some parents uh, were taking it to the extreme. So it was one of them where one parent said to me that, you know, this is great. Uh, my boy feels like he's a professional footballer where he can train every day. And I'm like, okay. Uh, but then when you looked at his um, videos and the timings of his runs, he was covering a lot of mileage. And I was afraid that he was going to get... Um, fatigued, mentally fatigued and I've had to talk to the parent two or three times just to kind of like get over you know my understanding uh, of what this was all about and what we were trying to achieve and what the kids but from the kids point of view um, and again I'll just mention it we we do a zoom meeting every week um, and they have an opportunity to have you know three minutes now I've had to buy zoom uh, a zoom uh, package because these meetings aren't 40 minutes, they're uh, <laughs> 90 minutes because yeah. the, boy, the boys want to talk to each other, but the boys want to express themselves and they want to talk about what they've actually been doing. So what we've said now is after the first one, which was like a, a tea party, um, I think Fortnite came out, FIFA, they were throwing things at the TV and it was just chaos. But it was great because I sat there for 35 minutes and just laughed. Um, but we've got a bit of structure in there now where the boys are talking about three things that they tried to achieve and uh, also a, a performance problem. But that performance problem could be schoolwork. It could be one of their sessions. It could be a, a technical or a skill. It could be, you know, they haven't had enough time because mom and dad, you know, are working for the NHS. Um, so they've had their opportunity to talk about that. But it's been received really, really well. Um, the academy manager, as I, I spoke, he's spoke to the parents. They've spoke about it. And I think, you know, it's not just Sheffield United. You know, I've seen many, many clubs across the, uh, across the country, you know, across the world that have been doing exactly the same. Uh, and yeah. I think, you know, credit to, credit to them all. Brilliant. And I think one of the things what, what made me smile as well was obviously keeping your, your players engaged with the game. Um, but... The, the things you've touched on around social, you know, social time, making sure kids are kids. I think we can all lose sight of that sometimes because we're, we're so engrossed with the game as adults. Got to remember that children are children and, and kids will be kids and we want them to be kids because that's the best times of your life. Um, and and it, it, I love the family training session which you touched on, but things like cook a, cook a meal and prepare a workout snack and just, just giving young people that ownership and that responsibility. Oh, go and wash your own kit. Give, give your mum a breather, all, all of that stuff. But life skills as well and, 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 and those to social be fair, skills. To, to be fair, sorry, Paul. To be no, fair, that came, from my, that came from my daughter. 
because brilliant. I was work, I was brilliant. working, and I'm sat there, and all she's doing is she's bringing a pot. She's ten year old, okay, and she's bringing her pots out of her bedroom, and she's just putting them in the sink. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> what are you doing? I, I've, I've got three of them. And it was like, no, no, there's going to be a little bit of structure now. That's a dishwasher. That's where you put them. So I'm thinking, anyway, when I spoke to uh, some of the parents, and I did get some bizarre phone calls, they said, Mac, will you have a word with uh, such and such? Why, what's up? And they went, well, he's not showering. Right, okay. He's not cleaning his teeth. Right, okay. All right, so they passed the phone over. And uh, I said, "Um, why aren't we showering? Oh, well, we're not at school. I said, okay. I said, if you were on tour, I said, and you went on a tour with Chef United, or you were at a tournament, You'd have to get up, have your breakfast, get showered, and then, you know, get ready to go to the venue. Yeah. I said, would you clean your teeth? They went, yeah. I said, well, what's the difference? And they went, okay. So, again, these life skills. And it was actually my, my daughter that was a catalyst behind that. <laughs> She's still not done it, by the way. <laughs> I can definitely imagine I've got two of those. And there's been some uh, laws laid down. But for the benefit, and I think young people do, they like that responsibility when you give it them um, yeah. in terms of, you know, can you do this? There's your challenge, you know. Um, I've got to be careful with my daughter, ba- my youngest daughter, baking me cakes and stuff. I don't want to bake too many. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, brilliant insight. Um, and thanks for sharing. And we'll, we'll cover some more of that. Ian, just, just to bring you in, because I know we've covered um, a lot with um, Matt and Sheffield United and, and the fantastic work they've been doing. But... Um, Obviously, with, with your programmes and, and not being able to train in person with players, um, how, how have you gone about ensuring that you can still engage with the players and continue with, with their development? That's definitely changed in the last uh, two and a half months, and I think um, yeah. for, the, for the better, actually. Um, when we first started this whole thing, it's, it's funny. Actually, I, I just went out and spent uh, about a month uh, prior to this filming outdoor videos for uh, – for the upcoming uh, weeks ahead, thinking that we've been moving outdoors as opposed to being in, in gyms and so forth. So um, that kind of backfired on me a little bit. <laughs> so we had the, the challenge right away of the kids not having space to, to train, basically. So they can really follow what I put together as, as well. And that's where top, one of the main reasons we went, made that, that switch. The kids um, couldn't go to the park. Uh, they had limited space. Our weather wasn't great still. So we may have days, we had some snow up till a couple of weeks ago, believe it or not. So they have very, um, very small areas to train in. I found a real difference once we actually started doing uh, Zoom calls on a weekly basis. I cleared part of my basement out. I had some old turf uh, from a couple of years ago. I laid down and I just started. It helped me tremendously as well as a coach. I was missing coaching. Uh, so I really enjoyed getting back um, with, with that. We've had a steady um, um, 25 people, a session every week. We're actually doubling up for June now as well. Uh, just a small area, I think eight feet by eight feet in my basement. Um, and we're trying to do as well is get the kids fully engaged in terms of current number of touches, that, that kind of stuff as well. The other thing we've done is um, came across a program called Coach Now. So the kids are able to go out and do their own work and their homework with the top techers, et cetera, but also post their videos, uh, post their videos, which is great. So everyone's seeing what everyone else is doing and it's building up that social camaraderie a little bit as well. Uh, I know you're the point now where the kids are even taking responsibility for even sending me notes. I've, I've done yoga six o'clock in the morning, right? So the business doing, we, we built obviously things like yoga, uh, game analysis, little things that got around the technical component. Um, yeah. And the big thing we sort of said the kids already own once saying to them, it's a f- fantastic opportunity, this. Uh, go learn new language. Um, go spend more time with your family. Try things you haven't done before. I said, I'm 55 years of age. I really have not the chance myself to kind of reset it a little bit and, and look around and yeah. see what things I haven't done. So that's one thing, one message we try to get out because obviously there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear uh, because of what, you know, what was happening. I think it's important for players to kind of see the opportunities there versus kind of dwell in the negatives in terms of can't see their friends. But I think yeah. obviously they went from an environment where they're at school every day, structured environment, uh, a training environment which is structured. North American lifestyle is very, very busy. So a lot of these kids were finishing school, literally, you know, by jumping in the car, going to a training session, getting home late at night, doing homework late, et cetera. So it went from a very structured environment. So initially, initially I just assigned my, my homework program, uh, to be honest. And then the feedback was there wasn't much structure that. The kids really weren't engaging very much initially. Um, so once I started adding some structure to that and sort of saying, well, here's how your day met, might look. You can adjust if you want and take ownership of that. You've obviously got, got things like your grandparents been looking after you, maybe away somewhere, babysitting, whatever. 
just adapt to it. And we didn't make it compulsory. We just said it's optional. Here's some ideas. If you guys want to spend time doing things, I would say our engagement for the home program uh, by moving top tech courses went from a 20% to probably 100% in terms of uh, engaging wow. kids doing it. Wow. Um, it was interesting that I sent it out um, initially, and one of the young boys sent me a note back after a day and said, Okay, I've done all the skills. What now? What next? <laughs> I've completed football. I've completed football. Yeah. So I've been next sport. Yeah. So I, I kind of turned it around. I said to him, what, what do you think you should do next? And he said, try to improve my scores. I go, there you go. There you, go. you have the answer. Yeah. But uh, it was interesting that way. They love the, um, the trophies. They love the, the scores. Uh, we actually have four or five players right now tied to the very top, which is great. So a little bit of competition, which is healthy. But I think the biggest thing for me was just the videos. I think that's really helped them to um, engage. We have players on our Zoom sessions um, uh, in their back garden. We have some in their basements. We have some uh, in the driveways. We have some the parents have never cleaned the living room out, <laughs> the carpets are up and the hardwood floors and, and doing a session in there, which is, is tremendous. And oh, yeah. the one thing I kind of got the players to do was think a little bit more about train loads, things like that. So a little more giving me feedback on um, you know, RPE's uh, active time. So if you may have a 30 minute session, but how long are you active? Maybe 20 minutes in that, that time frame. What's your, what's your intensity level? What's your training load? Just kind of think about those things a little bit more. So not getting kids posting videos and putting those scores in, which is tremendous. Just create some conversation. And I think that um, one of the things I've noticed the last, in my time here in North America, when we take players overseas um, from ages 11 plus, we find the players in North America a little bit, not as uh, mature, if you will, uh, as some of the European kids uh, in terms of taking responsibility for themselves, whether that's washing their kit or like you say, carrying their own boots, things like that. So I've found a real difference the last two months with our players. Um, I've found players um, be more responsible for communication with us in terms of getting the chat line. They're asking me things regarding the schedule, things they got or any, any questions yeah. they had. Before this whole thing happened, I would say 90% of my communication was with parents via email, right? So that's, that part's changed. Um, and the players are not pushing me for more stuff, to be honest, which, which I love. I think that's great. And it's a real sign of things. Yeah. But the kids are doing stuff off the bat themselves. We're just giving them a little bit of structure, a little bit of assistance along the way. But I've seen kids really, really change uh, for the better, be more responsible the last, last two, two months, two and a half months. Yeah, I think, I think you bring some very relevant points up there, Ian, about, you know, very rarely do any of us in, in, in football get a chance to hit the reset button. When you're in it every day, it, it, yeah. you're on to the next. And, and then we all go on our coaching courses and talk about the importance of reflection. <laughs> oh, it'd be nice, nice if we got two minutes. That's <laughs> um, right. But now we've got time and whilst it's not ideal to not be able to train and, and get back onto the field, uh, I think, you know, the, 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 the thought processes and what, what coaches and players and families are coming up with is when we get back to the field, there's going to be so many new ideas and it's going to be mm -hmm. a chance for us to really implement. But um, quick question for why do you think that the engagement increased so much by using a technical app? Because we are in a different generation. Was it a case of they could see challenges from the similar, was it a case of they can record the scores and see the progress? Or was it a case of I can now show my coach that I can do this or compete against my players? Or is it a mixture of everything, do you think? I think the biggest thing is, especially in North America, we're very much based upon team dynamics versus individual, developing individual. And that's yeah. kind of an area I've kind of, I love that, that part of things. So I've kind of focused on that area myself and, and try to drive things forward as best I can with my players and that. So there really was, a, I think, in my opinion, a lack of uh, ball work amongst North American players um, at a very basic state of one player, one ball. I think this part is around 360. Yeah. It's kind of forced it, forced to change a little bit. I think players are spending more time with the ball than they have in the past and individually as well, as opposed to, I think it's a little concept over here of, um, again, it's right structure. I show up uh, to a session, the coach tells me what to do, I leave, I go home. <laughs> it's very much that kind of, that kind of uh, culture in, in place. And now the kids can go away anytime they want in their driveway, in their basement, try things, spend as long as you want. If that's 30 minutes, great. If that's 20 minutes, great. If that's an hour and a half, great. That's up to them, okay? But I think what I've seen is, is players develop a real love of, love of the ball. And that's, that's for, for me, fantastic. And I think that's been the biggest change. Right. They always love a competition, but I think, um, I think the thing for me has been the love of the ball. And that's, that's fantastic in my, my opinion. Excellent. It actually links nicely into to my next question. And I'll ask Matt it first and I'll, I'll come back to you. But um, 
Matt, talk, Ian's talking about a love for the ball and obviously the foundation phase is so important. Right now in coaching, there, there seems to be this, you know, in some quarters, this tech, unopposed versus opposed debate or technical versus game-related practice. For me, I want everything anyway. I want my players to be technically competent and understand the game, and it's a process. Um, but for the foundation phase, how important is technical mastery and how much time do you spend players on technical mastery of course you have a games program and everything else but but is that a key component for, for your foundation phase players do you think yeah i think there is i think there's a there's a high percentage um within our program you know for the technical parts uh, part of the game um when you talk about technical and you mean you know, you're linking into you know ball mastery and connections on the ball you know the aerial and the groundwork you know, when people talk about the uh, the techniques, I think it's just about keeping the ball on the floor. Uh, but again, you know, that uh, confidence to actually deal with different parts of your body. You know, and I know there's a big thing about heading at the moment, you know, about ages yeah. and, you know, what should be right, what should be wrong. Uh, but I think it links down to the confidence, you know, if one, you know, if the child wants to go and head the ball, are they bright enough, are they brave enough to go and take it on the chest, you know, on the thigh, on the shin? You know, are they really clever trying to, you know, land it on the back of the neck? So, again, it links back into that expression. But for me, the techniques of that ball mastery, that mastering, you know, that love of the ball, uh, being comfortable in there. Um, again, you know, when you put it into game situations, uh, and I talk about it with one of the uh, FRYCDs back at, uh, back at the club, about, you know, having the skills, the feints and the turns. You know, having yeah. that uh, opportunity to beat players or to get yourself out of tight situations. Again, you know, when you're talking about dribbling and staying on the ball, I, you know, it's about that expression and, you know, whether you're working at speed or you're working agility, coordination, you're working your body. I think it's all part of that. And again, it's just building blocks. You know, again, you know, Ian can probably give, uh, you know, probably talk more about the 1v1s that I can. Uh, but, you know, that 1v1, you know, me against you, you against me and understanding them cues and triggers. Um, yeah. We, two years ago, three years ago, we, we employed a, a guy who is basically, he is a, a panner player, he's a panner expert. And uh, again, he looks at cues and triggers of that 1v1 and now that 2v1. And he actually works in the, uh, the pre-academy and the bottom age with the under nines. Again, it's all about that um, contact on the ball. You know, again, you know, shifting your weight, shifting your balance, using that protection. And I think, again, you know, if boys love to stay on that ball and dribble at players, you know, why should we as coaches go, yeah. No, no. Again, them decisions will come when they have to pop the ball off and they have to play around somebody. But again, who's playing the game? Me or them? So again, their decisions, yeah. we're just supporting them with it. So I think it's, uh, I think it's a massive part of the academies. I think it's a, a big part of, a big chunk of Sheffield United with that connection and combining with the ball. Um, but, you know, for me, at such a young age, they have to be exposed to that. Brilliant. Um, Ian, obviously, I asked you the, the same question about the importance of, of um, you know, that, that technical mastery. It's probably a bit of a loaded question because I can guess the answer. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely... I'm going to show your slide as well because yeah. I really like this slide, what you showed around your technical training delivery, but how it impacts across all areas of the game. You know, you mentioned technique, tactical, physical, psychological. And your end of season KPIs, if you like, or, or or measures successful in application of technical skills during game situations, which is the measure of a player as well. So, you know, how important and how big of a chunk does does that technical training piece play for you then? Yeah, it's massive. In fact, we spend, uh, like I said, six months a, a year indoors in, in gyms. And I use a tennis ball quite a bit in our sessions. I would say every session, for example, just to get, like, like Matt alluded to, the balance in the ball, shifting your body weight and so forth. Um, I find that very, um, uh, very useful in terms of accelerating a player's technical, technical ability just to find the last couple of years. Um, I was actually over in Italy a couple of years ago with Kevin Verona. And Matt pointed that the ball is not always going to be in the grind, is it? We always wanted to be there, but not always the case. So Kevin Verona actually developed a, a program or academy where it was ball master in the air. So 90% of their work was ball master in the air. So for example, doing a 1v1, the ball was chipped into the player. I take a ball in the chest, bring it down and play from there. Little things like that. I saw a 4v4 game in the air over there. So a different way of looking at things, definitely. 
And it kind of impacted my coaching a little bit too, because I've always been used to ball mash on the grind, great moves, skillful moves, one v ones, all kind of good stuff. But reality is, like Matt had mentioned, the ball is not always in the grind. Um, so we have to as coaches look at those situations. And I think it's also important that I told debate regarding opposed, unopposed, that when we're doing unopposed training, it's very important we explain to the players the relevance of that to a game. Okay, why are we doing this? How is that going to link into the game? Even though there's no opposition, we want the players to think about checking their shoulders, scanning, all those good habits, even though there's not, nobody in front of them, right? Um, yep. I always feel you've got to work on all four components of the game, obviously, all four corners. But I always say to players that the technical part of the game will limit you. That can be one way can limit you how far you go in the game. So whilst all our parts are equally important, I think the technique is, for me, the foundation. Uh, and I always said to them, like, don't build a house with a strong foundation. So it's a big part of uh, what I do. Uh, obviously, my players are coming to me for additional training. So I have to get, look at that and say, what are the, what are the parts from not getting somewhere else? Um, not getting as much individual focus, maybe, in a team environment. And that's one of the reasons they come to me. Uh, I think also they're trying to accelerate. These are ambitious players, motivated players, a little bit extra. So they'll be getting three or four sessions a week at a club team, but they want some more. Okay. So I've got to look, up, look at that and say, how can I best help these players? I think technique is, for me, like yeah. it's massive. Yeah, and, and what you said about uh, both yourself and Matt said about building blocks and just comes back to, to the quote by Arsene Wenger. I think we've all heard it about yeah. building a player is like building a house. And if you don't have those technical foundations by the age of 13, 14, forget it. No, difficult, you can't build yeah. a house. We know oh, it's very difficult to build a house with no foundations. And that's come from one of, one of the best managers managers around. Um, in terms of obviously we're getting into this return to play phase now across the globe and teams are starting to consider, depending on where you are, uh, start to consider going back to, to to training with restrictions and then they'll get loosened off. But it's clear that the world has changed and how we're going to deliver football amongst other things has changed. So Matt, in terms of amendments to, to training programs and curriculums and and what what's going to happen moving forwards with, with the foundation phase for Sheffield United have there been any discussions around how you how you amend how you amend your future delivery we uh, we had a team meeting um, last week um, I think there was a, a meeting with the Premier League uh, about uh, return to play, you know, especially with kind of like the Premier League and the Championship, you know, talking about it. Um, so, you know, the academy manager sat down, you know, we got the meeting and we, we talked about, you know, us planning now, um, uh, but also being in mind, you know, taking in, you know, into consideration the, you know, the one and a half metres or the 1.5 to 2 metres, you know, less groups of five. Um, and what did that look like? You know, what did it look like from if we do get the opportunity to go back I don't see it being any different from what the boys have actually been doing uh, as part of their homework program. Uh, because again, you know, if you're, you're looking at doing carousels and you're working probably four or five players in there, what does that look like? It might be uh, some finishing, uh, it might be technical sessions, it might be ball master. But again, yeah. you know, um, in areas of, the way, uh, areas of the pitch that are they're away from each other, um, again, you can't get into that contact, but it might be, you know, long lofted passes. It might be a bit of combination play, but again, keeping them distances. But I think what, you know, the boys have been doing over the last eight weeks to 10 weeks, I can see that being transferred back into their uh, training program when they come back. And again, I think you said it earlier, a lot of that, um, them actions and kind of like the good practice they've been taking on board. You know, why why are we not asking the boys what they want to do as well? You know, because we should be picking their brain. Because again, I think with the, the group work that they've been, sorry, the individual work they've been doing in regards, you know, the agility coordination, kind of like the ball mastery, you know, aerial and ground, they might have been doing the skill school, they might have doing, been doing a bit of finishing, uh, a bit of technique work, you know, working off mannequins, if they're very, very lucky with what they've got in the garden. So, you know, for me, it's going to look very, very similar. It's just going to be reduced numbers. Uh, and again, it's making sure that we have that thought process with the coaches to make sure that them restrictions, you know, again, the biggest thing from me was when they see the mate, they want to go and give them a high five. And it's kind of like, you know, it's going to, we're going to struggle with that. You know, my daughter goes back to school on Monday and I, and again, I'm, I'm a little bit, mm, 
I don't know if she sees a friend, they're going to get a hug and so on. But it is what it is, you know, because the children, you know, and that's that's child's yeah. play. Um, but for me, there's not going to be much difference. And I think it's about us, us planning and it's us being careful. Uh, because, again, you know, the spotlight's going to be on us, not just from the governing bodies, but it's also going to be there from the parents, um, you know, the media itself, if we do go back. Uh, but I think, it, you know, the, the smaller sessions, the reduced sessions, you know, the distances between them. Uh, but it's what is in the programme, the elements of the ball contacts, them being creative, them, you know, when you look at the fitness work that they've been actually been doing, I think they've been very, very active while they've been away. And they've actually been stimulating the mind as well. So when they come back, I can't see a lot of them going, mm, yeah, you know, might have put a bit of weight on. No, 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 no. Let's get the ball down. Let's start doing some technical work. Let's do some finishing. But as long as it's safe and we create that really good, you know, safe environment where they're going to learn, I'm looking forward to it. Great. It's, you know, you make, again, make some great points. And I'm actually excited to go back. I, I've got uh, a couple of boys' teams and, I've challenged my boys. I've told them straight, when you come back to the field and when we do finally get out, I'm expecting you to technically be better than when you left, left <laughs> uh, and finished training. So the gauntlet's been laid down now because yeah. once we can get towards, you know, more contact and opposite, opposition, then your technical stuff should be in your locker. Nor do I want you to stop working on it now. Habit forming. You should have built that habit over two and a half months of getting out and getting touches on the ball and working on your technique. If, if young players keep those habits now, then it's going to make our life as coaches a lot easier because we can get to the game and coach the game quicker. Plus, we've got an opportunity to really have a generation of players who technically are better than they may have been previously in previous generations. Not saying two and a half months of the technical work's going to make the next generation of Zinedine Zidane's and Paul Scholes, but but hopefully that habit forming and that love for the ball and love for the game. Um, thanks for that, Matt. Uh, Ian, same for you, and I, I believe you sent an example in, which if, if I'm okay to share. Cause yeah, go ahead. I, I had just, a look at, at this. Yeah, I started, actually, started last Saturday. Uh, a little bit unique situation yep. in Canada because... Um, I'm a, a private academy. Um, the, the clubs right now in Canada cannot actually train um, because they're okay. sanctioned by the governing body. So they <clears throat> kind of come out, yeah, go ahead and train, and they, they, and they come back and said, no, we can't. So I was able to start just based upon the fact um, uh, five people max. So I started last Saturday uh, with, the, with the players, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, obviously different, different times. So I have to adapt as a coach and have to look at what we can do. I do quite a lot of one-on-one -on -one sessions. So my first instinct was to kind of go into the one-to-one -one format with the players. So they all had their, their own grid last uh, last Saturday. Uh, I sort of stayed through the middle and I had four grids around outside of me and worked for about 40, 45 minutes uh, with the players. Mostly technical stuff, as you, as you imagine. A little bit of physical stuff as well. But um, that's basically where we're at. Uh, things like players bringing their own balls, uh, drop-off, pick-up protocols, um, I had one player race up and try to hug me <laughs> first day, but obviously, like Matt mentioned, it's, it's, a, it's a new world to them. And um, it, was, it was kind of strange uh, having a distance between us, but it didn't seem that much we get going and get started. And as the coach, I'm trying to uh, as we go. Uh, so we'll probably go the month of June, I think, a combination of these kind of sessions uh, plus the Zoom session twice a week. I think that's what we're looking at in yeah. terms of um, this month going forward. Uh, until we know anything else from a, the, the governing bodies. Uh, our players are supposed to have an outdoor season. It should right now be in full swing. Um, so they're not sure whether our season will get kicked off or not. I mean, they may lose their outdoor season this year, which would be a real yeah. shame for everybody. So yeah. our players, in sort of calls I've, I've made to them, they sort of said the biggest frustration for them was just that they, may, they missed their season. So some were struggling a bit with motivation to why keep training when there's no games coming up. So that's part of it to try to keep them motivated with the um, top techers and so forth. A um, couple of things we've done, which we'll definitely keep in place. Um, I think obviously the Zoom sessions, and I'm going to retain those um, because they're very flexible the players. They can come home at uh, four o'clock in the afternoon when they're back to school, for example, and do 40 minutes of technical work, right? Yep. Um, second of all, we've also uh, had some webinars on a weekly basis. We've brought some guest coaches in to see, to talk to the players. I want to keep doing that. So I'll keep that going all year. I'm turning into a podcast series. So just again, to get a little more, um, more information to the players, we had the, uh, 
I had your friend Mark Cowell on there, Matt. <laughs> I got a hold of him. <laughs> and uh, we had James on from Fleetwoods and, and Ian Greer from Glasgow Rangers. So I think, um, Paul, just to answer your question, more interaction with the players. I think I've realized that we can do a lot more online now. I think the players are getting used to it. Uh, I've got 12-year-old yeah. players jumping on a, on a Zoom call with me one-on-one -on -one these days. And it doesn't phase them at all. It's the world they're in. Um, I, think the, I think the world's changed. Um, I think... Um, in football terms in Canada, like I mentioned, I think the focus is on individual development and it hasn't been that way. But I'm seeing a lot of benefits out of this thing. And um, I think I'll have to be careful with the, the session going forward. I believe in Holland, they're, they're having the U12s do contact training. And then after that, it's, it's six players per coach. So I'm not sure what, whether that become enforced here or not. Right now, I'm just like, doing the uh, Matt mentioned technical stuff and um, some physical work as well. But I told the players at the very beginning, um, come out of this thing flying. I said, come out and be the best around Ontario, be the best around Canada, come out of this thing. And that's what I'm seeing. They've actually rose to the challenge, which has been great to see. Brilliant. Uh, just a quick question for you, what's coming off uh, one of our uh, attendees, Ian, uh, from Ted. How, how does um, your, your return to play plan differ then from those individual at home sessions um, since they're, they're still working in a confined area? Uh, with no opposition, what what are the key components and differentiators in bringing players together, albeit safely and at a distance, as opposed to being online? What do you think are the key benefits for that? Yeah, I think the first sessions primarily have been the same, similar to the Zoom sessions in terms of uh, limited space. I had them work off a five meter by five meter grid last uh, last weekend, um, so it's quite similar to the technical work we're doing at home in the Zoom sessions. What I'm trying to do is obviously build up a passing sequence and passing play. We can do that safely yep. at distance and obviously some shooting as well. A little bit leery regarding the shooting because of obviously they've been at home working in confined spaces for a couple of months and a little worried about injury with that one right now. But let's kind of build it up gradually and go from there. I just want to keep it very simple to start. Uh, it was new for me as well to get started with that. And uh, just have to kind of figure it out uh, as we all do as coaches. Do, do you think the social interaction made a difference as well as opposed to, I know they weren't allowed to go near each other, but the fact that now you can see yeah. your teammate and, yeah. and a friend 10 yards away is still a huge difference than seeing them on a screen. And I've read some reports around, you know, how humans are having to work harder because we can't read the same cues uh, from human behavior on a screen that we can in person. So do you think that social interaction was important as well? Very, yeah, very important, definitely. In fact, one of the, the, the parents had told me that uh, one of the players had told them that uh, with the Zoom sessions, for example, that, that was the best 40 minutes of the week. The fact they were able to see, you know, be training their friends again. And that was the Zoom sessions. Yeah. I think getting back in the field together um, was, was great And in terms of um, – it was kind of like almost going back to one-on-one -on -one coaching when I started, started the swim session because it's all new to me regarding not having a physical plan in front of you. How do you start off with that? And you just have to work it out, basically. But I think it's massive for yeah. players to have a social aspect, especially because of lost school and seeing their friends at the same time. It's not just one thing that's been taken away. It's been, it's been their whole life, really, and, and how they sort of use to interact with, with their, their friends and, and so forth. So I think the, I think the social part is a big part that um, – and that's the that's strength of football, isn't it? We all love the game, and the social part of the game is massive. And I think we're all recognizing Brilliant. how much we miss it and why we miss it so much. Brilliant. Absolutely. I agree with you. Um, so final question um, for the pair here. I'll ask Matt first. Um, have there been any clear success stories? I mean, it's been such a challenging time for everyone, and I think, you know, the globe, uh, the world has changed. We keep saying it, but... There's still positives. There's definitely positives. Has there been any success stories, Matt, to come off the back of it, um, whether it's football-related or non-football-related with, with some of your families and, and players or coaches even? I think they're all success stories. I think when you look at the eight to ten weeks that we've been in lockdown now, I think the, uh, the amount of work uh, that the boys, you know, not just from a, a school in the education, uh, whether it's designing their own practicing, you know, cooking a meal, uh, doing other, you know, other uh, jobs around the house. And again, you know, it's not just about what Sheffield United have achieved. It's, it's every club that's actually, you know, the clubs that have been uh, continuing to work. Unfortunately, the Jazz Club's been furloughed. Um, so they've, you know, they lost that contact time. Um, but the work that there's been in regards, you know, academy managers, head of coaching, you know, whether it's from, from a coaching point of view, you know, with the staff or with the parents. 
Um, again, I think it's been brilliant. And I think there's so many success, uh, success stories. Um, you know, I've got lads who, um, you know, uh, Ian spoke about the Zoom meetings. And the Zoom meetings for me, that social interaction has been massive. And I think having them, you know, as a group, so we've done under nines, under tens, under, uh, under tens, twelves, and so on. Uh, but we've also done the physical day. So the sports science has been on there. We've had the gymnastics on there. Uh, we've had the quizzes on there. But it's been really, really good because, again, it's about that interaction with the teammates, you know, seeing the coach, you know, having a bit of a laugh and a joke and so on. But I think everything that they've achieved with all the pictures and the clips, you know, the work that they've done with the schools, I think that's an achievement. And I think the kids, uh, you know, they've motivated themselves. Uh, again, it'd be interesting when they come back to play, uh, how motivated they are to continue in their good habits. But I think every success story that a club has achieved, you know, whether it's little Johnny at nine or a 12 that, you know, he's wrote down a, a programme and he's cooked a, you know, a chicken balti or whatever it is. I think they're all success stories. And, I, and you know, mm. I'm, so, so, I'm so grateful, you know, to, to the, the children because they've been open minded. Nobody's turned, you know, the noses up at it. They've had a go at it, you know, whether I have to say I am the worst cook ever. And they asked me to cook something. So I cooked something and I showed them and they absolutely hammered me for 10 minutes. <laughs> but you know what? I went, okay. I said, come on. I said, you, I said, you back it up then. You show me. So I've got pictures of cakes. I've got rice. I've got chicken. I've got a Sunday dinner. I've got milkshakes. But Everything across the board, I think, has been a success story yeah. for every boy that's been participated. Yeah, uh, um, I could I could take your title for the worst cook ever. Man. Actually, I, can't, I, can't boil, I can't boil an egg. That's shocking. I, I'm the same. My, my daughter last night, who's eight years old, actually cooked me a butter chicken curry, and I was all over it, like, yeah, this will do for me. So. Absolutely, those are the benefits. I've not learned to cook, I never will. At all. <laughs> but, um, brilliant insights, uh, Ian. Uh, same for you in terms of success stories. What do you think are the key successes come, coming out of, of this period? Yeah, similar to Matt, just I'd be mean, bold away, be honest with uh, what our players have done. Um, I've told them I'm very proud of what they've done, uh, and I got excited also sort of watching the videos and seeing them. It could be out in the street, it could be uh, on the driveway, it could be anywhere. Anyone find a spot and a, a ball. And that to me is, is something to be missing in North America. Go back to basics, go back to working with the ball and, lo and love of the ball. I think for me, that's something that's came really, really uh, clear to the floor. Second of all, is like I said, the ownership piece uh, regarding uh, even with top tackers. I know you can actually assign the players, um, you know, their training plan. I kind of did a yeah. different approach. I said to them, I go, you guys design your own plan. Go off, look at the app, Brilliant. have a look at things, come back and sort of tell me you've done. All right, so they were going off themselves and working those things out, which I think is very, very important. So um, I'm looking forward to getting, you know, getting them back in the field. And this is one thing we sort of mentioned that we've I've been watching the last dance with uh, Michael Jordan and yeah. especially relevant over here. I'm, I was never a basketball fan myself and, and loved the series, but um, I think it's a, a message we try to convey to the players. Really, it's we've we've given you inf information, we've given you suggestions what you can do during your downtime, uh, but really it's up to you. And it's really a bit of personality. And I've seen people respond to that in a very positive way. Uh, even uh, along the lines of the younger players watching the older players and obviously met it from them as well and sort of seeing one of the players say, yeah, I saw Jack try this last week, so I thought I'd try it this week kind of thing. So that whole, that whole community part, even though we haven't seen it sort of physically, it's still a community. Uh, our, our training yeah. environment is still a community. Uh, everyone still loves the game together. Everyone still shares uh, love of the game together. So I think a couple of things come out of this for me is, like I said, love of the, love of the ball. And second of all, the ownership I've seen the players taking. It's been fantastic. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, I'd agree with every one of those comments from, from yourself, Ian, and from Matt. And, and again, you know, some great learnings from the last dance. Uh, not so many learnings from Tiger King, but <laughs> a, few, a few from last dance. I started watching F1 Drive to Survive last It's night. good. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah. A fantastic series. I'm probably late right to the game on that one, but I was taking so much from that and, and a push to the, to the players if interested. It's, it's got to be them who, 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 were the, who were interested. So brilliant. Um, that, you like cricket, that, Paul? Um, I don't know which end of the bat to hit it with, <laughs> but yeah, I, I like it. <laughs> no, there's a, I think there's a documentary on Amazon. Uh, where I think it's the the test uh, about Australia. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, I've heard about this. Yeah, very, very, yeah. very good. I'm sorry, I've watched the last dance and I've just uh, watched the test and 
the very, very good insight, a real good insight about kind of like the culture and where they were and how they went forward. Yeah, very, very powerful. Really, really good. Yeah, I've heard that one. I'll put that on, on my watch list um, when I get time with, 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 in between all my Zoom meetings and, and, and technical planning. But um, I want to say a massive thank you, uh, Matt and Ian, for, for joining us uh, today. Some great insights and some practical examples, really, on how both professional clubs and, and private organisations and, and, and coaches are using um, technology, are using this time to, to keep engaged with players and families. I think it's absolutely vital that we've done that. And there's, like, like you both said, there's so many fantastic examples of, of people doing some great work during this time. And we're all, we're all itching to get back to the field, but when it's safe to do think and, and we do it appropriately and, and we, like we said we continue with these good habits for, for me as I said earlier I'm excited about my players coming back and showing me in person now technically what they can do and how as a coach now I've got to think with that technical level raised I'm going to have to raise my game in terms of how I challenge them um, so there, there's, there's all sorts of benefits and we've got to see the positives as well because it's not an ideal situation but Again, massive thank you to all the attendees who joined us on either YouTube Live or, or directly via the Zoom call. Um, Ian, uh, where can coaches and players and parents find you? Uh, so happy for you to, to plug your site or plug any social media handles you've got. Yeah, it's just the Ian McClure Learn Perform .com basically. So that's the best way to find me. And if any coaches want to reach out and, and, and um, touch base, and I'll help them as best I can. Fantastic. Uh, and Matt, is there any way to reach you? I couldn't find you on social media. I don't. I don't. I don't know uh, I'm, on no, I'm, I'm on Twitter. No, I'm. I'm on Twitter. So it's. Uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter. I'll send that through to you. But you know, my yeah. email address is matt.morley at sufc.co.uk. Um, so if anybody wants to drop me a line and kind of like you know make that communication, Brilliant. fantastic. Yeah, I think that's another benefit right now. Coaches are actually talking to each other. Yeah, definitely. Um, the, the top coaches always were open and engaged. Um, but the game, because it's so competitive, people have been a bit like my ball <laughs> type. So I'm not showing you my secret sauce. Um, but as a result, we've all started sharing more and more. And, and there's no secret to this game. It's it's that what's best for the individual players at, at, at all times and, 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 and navigating that path. So... Really appreciate your time, uh, gentlemen. Thank you for giving us your time. As always, the recording will be on the Um Everyone, enjoy the rest of your afternoon or evening, wherever you are. And thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thank Stay safe. Thanks, Matt. You too. Thanks, Ian. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, now. Bye.